Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online every Saturday. Listen, y'all. God does not want us hanging out with fools. God wants us to know the difference between a wise one and a fool and a foolish one. And he doesn't want the foolishness rubbing off on us. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to start out with Psalms. And I want you to come with me on that. And that'll be a quick read. Whew, my goodness. Okay, here we go. Psalms chapter, oh, where is it? There it is. Psalms chapter one. Okay, that's a short one, so that's good. And that says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Make sure I'm recording here just a moment. Got to double check. There it is. Okay. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the, in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in due season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Throughout the ungodly, excuse me, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. So they're not going to be standing when judgment comes. They're going to be, woo, or they're not going to be happy campers, y'all. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now, let me say this real quick. A lot of us don't realize Jesus tells us we will know them by the fruit they bear. And there are times when they are bearing fruit, but they're not bearing fruits of righteousness. They are bearing rotten fruit. And we have to be careful about who we hang with. Sometimes we let people take up our time. And I'm telling you, God led me to these scriptures. So I'm going by what he led me to. Sometimes we're hanging with people out of the goodness of our hearts. Sometimes we think that we are going to rescue them. We're going to fix them. We're going to help them. We're going to be a guide to the blind and we're going to lead them to the way everlasting. And they might be hanging with you because your pockets are deep. Your face is pretty. Your face is fine. Your face is handsome. Your body is, is stacked like a brick house. You got the body of Hercules, whatever the case may be. People hang out with people for different reasons, and they know how to talk the God jargon. They know how to talk the sweetheart jargon. They know how to talk the friendship jargon, but it's not necessarily so. So you have to make sure that you are constantly asking God for the gift to operate in you from the Holy Spirit. And that gift I'm talking about is the gift of discerning of spirits. And I'm going to share a situation that some of you already know about. I was in just a week and a half ago, and I sought godly counsel from four different people who were at totally four different stages of development. I mean, one of them was a Christian, but carnal. Another one was a Christian, but, you know, maybe not that deep. And two of them were veterans. Now, this is what I want to share with you. All four of them, not one knew the other. Here's the comical part. They all four said two or three things alike. That was, I prayed before I called them. And I asked God for not only discernment, but for a consensus, I always ask for a consensus because sometimes you have to check yourself. I had to check me to make sure it wasn't the selfishness that abides in my flesh and rears its ugly head sometimes. So I had to make sure it wasn't that selfishness that was guiding my 
my decisions, my feelings, my what I was picking up. Sometimes you think somebody looks suspicious, acts suspicious, sounds suspicious, or there's something about them that doesn't sit right with you. It's not always them. Sometimes it's you. So I took that to God and asked him, I asked him to please check me and make sure my motive is right. So I asked four people. The thing that all four people said in common was, well, what's wrong with this or what's wrong with that? I don't want to go into detail because I don't want to put anybody's business out there in case they know the same person in the circumstance. They would know exactly who I was talking about. This person I had not seen or heard from for seven years. No less than six. Seven years. Now listen, we were never close. We were never what you would call friends or even hangout buddies. It never got to that point because their life was too busy to hang out and do anything. So we would only see each other at church and maybe two or three times out of a six month period, we might be able to exchange some greetings back and forth, small talk before we went on our merry way. So all of a sudden there's this crisis and this person, the things they were saying didn't sound right. It didn't sit right. It didn't add up. And I'm very good at math, y'all. <clears throat> anyway, so what I did was I went to four people after I prayed to God. And I asked God to make them say the same thing so that I would know as a sign that God was saying I made the right decision. Okay? So... Excuse me, got a hangnail, had to bite that off. It's hurting. Anyway, so each person said, well, what happened to A, B, and C? Why isn't that happening? Why is that not bringing a solution to the problem? That's an automatic. That sounded fishy to me too. The next thing they asked is, why are they calling you when they don't even know you that well? And I said, yeah, I thought the same thing. That was strange. And number three, all three of them, I mean, all four of them said the same thing in a different way. One said, what if you get her in your house and you can't get her out? Another one said, what if you get her in the house and they want another week and then another two weeks and then another and then a month and then they try to see if they could stay there for good. Another one said, well, what if uh, you can't get them out and they decide that they're going to take you to court if you want them out and they will make you pay for them to be able to get out? And they said people have almost lost their houses behind that because that can go up into the thousands. I didn't even know that. So everything I'm hearing is nothing but uh, it's just red flag over here, red flag over there, red flag everywhere. And the thing I really appreciated was one of them was at my house when the person called uh, the third time when they were supposed to wait till that following night. And the person that was in my kitchen said, I got a knot in my stomach when I heard that voice. It sounded so I can't tell you the feeling is just, it's really not right. And I said, okay, thank you. That's what I need to hear. Um, everything that people told me made me feel free and comfortable saying no, but I never had to say no because they called at a time when I couldn't answer. And then when I, I was going to call them back, the Lord kind of set me down and said, just leave it alone. It will go away on its own. And that's exactly what happened. I never heard any more. So um, I just want to, I, I want to thank the four people. They know who they are. I want to thank the four people for taking the time to give me godly counsel. And I don't care how much you guys think. Now, this is for everybody listening now. I don't care how much you think you know, how much you 
how many years of this education you got, how many degrees you got behind your belt, how many this, that, or the other. You better learn to listen because the Bible says there is safety in the multitude of counsel. And if you hear 10 people saying the same thing, that's what you call a consensus. If you hear three or four people saying the same thing, or 50 people over the course of 50 years telling you the same thing about yourself or about your situation, you better you better perk up and listen, because that could have been God trying to tell you something, but you're so hard-headed, stubborn, and full of your pride that you refuse to listen to godly counsel, because it disagrees with yourself. Uh, let me see. How can I say it? It disagrees with your preconceived notions. Hmm. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end of that way. Hmm. Yeah, you fill in the blanks. It ain't good. All right. Now, let's go with me to uh, Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14. Real quick. Proverbs chapter 14. And we're going to read from one to seven. Now, I'm not just aiming this at women, even though that can, you know, women can be messy, y'all. But this is about men as well. So don't get sidetracked by the fact that it opens up ad addressing women. Every woman, this is starting from verse one to seven. Every wise woman buildeth her house. But the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. That's him or her, y'all. He that walketh in, a, in his right, let me say this right. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. But he that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. In the mouth of the fool, in the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride. But the lips of the wise shall preserve him. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by strength of an ox. A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. That's why it's good. When you ask God for wisdom, you better ask him for understanding too. Go from the presence of a foolish man. This is the bottom line right here. Verse seven, go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceiveth not in him the lips of knowledge. See, what you get from a foolish person is they mock sin. They'll laugh at sin like it's entertaining to them. They'll talk about their sins like they're proud of their accomplishments. They will gossip about someone else's sins because they like smearing other people's names and making them look bad in front of everybody because to them it's a source of entertainment. Gossip. Girl, did you hear? Mm, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Did you see what brother man did? Oh my, mm, let me tell you that, will, that mm, that's gossip, baby. I mean, that just gets down and dirty. And some of you love it. You lap it up like a dog lapping up his favorite meal. You just eat it all up because you love it. Why do you love it? What's so exciting about hearing about someone else's dirt? What's up with that, y'all? Hmm. Yeah, what's up with that? And here's the sad part. The more you hang with people who gossip, the more you gossip. The more they say, the more you're going to say. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, wait, 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 but did you hear this? Wait, 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 I got a good one for you. You got to hear, oh, oh my goodness, you won't believe this. Check this out. Do you know they had the gold? Mm. And all you did was you heard it through the grapevine. So you're taking what you got from the grapevine and you're passing it on. Like folks sitting around the circle, passing the joint around. Pass that joint. Give me a, I, I want. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. And you don't realize how tacky, how low that is. Some of y'all do it with family members. Some of you do it with neighbors. 
Some of you do it with the guy down the street or the store or the storekeeper or the gas station owner. Some of you do it. You pass around news about, did you hear about Pastor so-and-so? Did you hear about Bishop so-and-so? Did you hear? Yeah, they said they kicked him out to church. Did you hear about? Oh, oh man, they called him red-handed. Did you hear? I hear it even online, y'all, people on YouTube talking about other pastors and how they're falsely doing this and falsely doing that, casting judgment, making the person look bad instead of praying for them. They're blasting their name all over, accusing them of stuff they don't even know about because they heard it through the grapevine. You don't realize how that stuff gets off on you. Smut, reap smut. That's all there is to it. And if you like feeding off of smut, you're doing something God hates because smut is a sower of discord. Smut smears people's names and reputations. Smut destroys some people. But you're running around, open your mouth wide, spitting it out, baby. You eat it up over here and you spit it out over there. Mm -hmm. And you love it. You love every minute of it. And you love hanging around people who know the inside scoop. But they don't necessarily know the inside scoop. They're feeding off of what they got too. And you know with this media, you don't know what you're getting when it comes to truth or lies. You don't even know, but you're believing it like it's the gospel. Be careful with that. Because if you love your brother, if you love the sister, if you love the pastor, if you love the body of Christ, you won't talk bad about any of them. You stay out of those conversations, which is the best thing to do. If you go quiet when somebody starts reaming somebody up and down and and, and, and getting all into the skeletons of their closet and blasting them on the front page, they'll start getting the message. You're not having it. You're not being a part of it. They're free to do what they want, but you do not have to sit there and be their garbage can, do you? Think about it now. Some of y'all do it with Oh, my goodness. Some of y'all do it with the corporate head. You do it on your job. You're gossiping about what this one did in their cubicle and how that one, they think they're getting ready to lay them off because they think they got a drinking problem. You don't know it. You heard it through the grapevine, standing at the water cooler. Some of y'all do it with the politicians. You know they're this and you know they're that. You just know, you know, you know that you know that you know. And you got it through the grapevine like everybody else. And all you're doing is making people look bad in other people's eyes. That's not God's way. You have become someone else's garbage can. And you are making other people garbage cans as well. See, what we don't realize is Satan is an accuser of the brethren. And when you don't know a person personally, even the Bible says, know them that labor among you. When you don't know them personally, you don't have any right to talk about their business. You don't have any right to put them down. There are people that I, <laughs> wow, if I had a chance, I would give them a piece of my mind in person. But I'm not going to be sitting around the table and they're going to be the center of my conversation. It's just, I used to be that way, y'all. I'm not talking like I never did it. I used to, I used to pig out on some gossip and I can spit it out real good. But God convicted me of it. And I'm very careful. <laughs> I have to guard myself. I don't even want to be around it because I know I have the tendency. So I want to let sleeping dogs lie. And that and that giant sleeping dog in me, I'm not going to feed it. Anything that's going to wake it back up. Because I don't want to go back to the beggarly elements of my flesh. I don't want to do that. When I notice, check this out. I noticed when I was hanging out with my family more and 
God brought circumstances to make me hang out with them less. And I love my family, but my family has always cussed like sailors. That includes me. So it took me two years to get all that out of my system where it wasn't instinctive and impulsive. I had to really fight to shove that bad boy down and mortify that deed of the flesh. Now I can honestly say, excuse me, honestly say y'all, I might, I'm not perfect, but I might slip once a year or twice a year. And when I hear it coming out my mouth, I'm fighting to keep it back because I don't want to do that. I'm in God's presence 24 seven. I respect God enough not to use any language that's offensive to him, not to use any language that's common to this, to this world. I don't use, I just, I don't. There are certain words I know aren't really cuss words, but I even stray away from those. Not that I'm afraid I'm committing a sin, but I don't want that to lead to another. In other words, it's not living a tightrope. It's if I can control it, I will. If I'm not going to use that language in front of my boss, in front of a politician, in front of royalty, definitely I shouldn't be using it in front of God. And he's, he's, he's in my breath. He's in me. There's no time that I'm not in his presence because he's omnipresent everywhere all at once. So I owe him that much respect to deny myself the right, the privilege to use whatever words I want to use just because it's convenient and it's got a good punch. It has that little zap, that little zing. Yeah, I, don't, I know how fun it can get cussing. I know it. I know how much fun it can be gossiping. I know that too. I wasn't born yesterday and I wasn't born with angel wings. I was born in sin and shaping in iniquity. And I'm telling you, it took a long time to get that crap out of me. Long time and a lot of struggle. But I didn't, I didn't get at ease in Zion. I didn't kick back in my recliner and decide, hmm, that ain't going to take me to hell. So, I, you know, I just ain't, ain't no other word can say it like that. Oh, yes, it is. You just make up some. some <laughs> sometimes I say, oh, crap, oh, or, or oh, crap, or, you know, when normally it would be O-S-H. I haven't said the S-H word. I think that word I haven't said in about 10 or 15 years. I mean, actually slip and say it. Um, yeah, one of the other ones I, I said maybe about two years ago, a year and a half ago. Immediately, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> that, that got out before I could catch it. But thank God I was by myself. Okay, so now getting back to gossip and, and, and being a, what do you call it? Being a sower of discord. That is actually one of the things the Bible lists that God hates. That's one of those things, y'all. Because the problem with sowing discord is when the Bible says, when you come to bring your gift to the altar and you see that your brother or sister has ought against you or you have ought against them, leave your gift at the altar, go and be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. God does not want tainted gifts being offered to him. Whatever that gift is, it doesn't matter what it is, even if it's just your time or you're going to sing a song to him, you're going to worship and praise him. It goes up to him as stench when you have bitterness in your heart. It goes up to him as stench when you just sat there 
de debasing someone, derating them, or berating them, whatever the word is. You know, I make up some some words sometimes when I'm not getting it right. So, you know, just know I do realize I'm doing that. And it's not out of ignorance, okay? But sometimes it might be. But anyway, so sometimes when you're sitting there talking about somebody, the person you're talking to might not be as strong a Christian as you are. And you might talk about them and not even be thinking about it, and you're fine with them. While the other person, you just said A, B, and C about them that they didn't even know about. And now that person has issues with them. Now, they may not even know the person, y'all. But if they have issues with someone God considers your brother or sister in Christ, you have just created a schism in the body. And the Bible says, let there be no schism. In the body of Christ. There should be no schisms in the church. So when you take your lips. And treat them like scissors. And you take that person. With the other person they they heard of. Or know a little bit of. Or look up to. Your lips have become a pair of scissors. And you have just cut. And split the two apart. And it takes a supernatural move of God to put that back together again. You may even go back and apologize. I'm sorry for what I said. I was upset. But now that is in their head. It hasn't gone anywhere. And unless they are determined to get it out, they might live with that for years. Not quite feeling that warm to the person anymore. It may have soured their level of, lowered their level of respect for the person. And now you have enabled someone to cast judgment on somebody they barely knew because of something you said about them. Mm -hmm. See, we have to be careful. That is diametrically opposed to love. And what does God say about love? Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. First, you must love God. And if you love God enough to obey him, you keep that flap shut. You keep that, that, that pair of scissors closed so that they do no damage. You hear me? So you have to be careful about what you let fly out of that bell clapper of yours. Because when you go to worship God, or you go to serve him, or you go to do whatever, read his word or pray to him, he might smell nothing but stench and hear nothing but gibberish. Because there's something between you and God. You have created a chasm with your schisms. <laughs> ah, I never thought of that. Let me say that again. That sounded pretty good. You have created a chasm with your schisms. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about that. Whatever you do has to be motivated out of love and respect, not out of contempt. You don't put people down and make fun of them just because they don't see your point of view. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you just don't do that. That's not God. That's flesh. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man. And then a lot of times we think we're right. We think we got the right. That's our opinion. Sometimes your opinion needs to be omitted from the conversation. Because your opinion could be causing more and more schisms in the body of Christ. And just because someone in the body of Christ does not agree with the way you think they should be doing something, does not mean you have the right to be the judge. What does the Bible say about that? Judge not, lest ye be judged. And to the same measure, here's another part, to the same measure that you judge someone else, to the same measure you do anything to someone else, the same measure will be done back to you. So be careful. Yeah, that's skating right there on thin ice. 
God may be love, but he ain't no flunky. God may be merciful, but remember, he's also a judge. Jesus might be your savior, but when the millennial hits, honey, he's going to be everybody's judge. You got to be very, very careful about that. All right. So seek God. Ask him to show you what's in your heart. Show him that. There are times, you know, many of us, we have uh, friends from all different backgrounds. And we're not always quick to admit the areas where there may be a little prejudice, the areas where we may be a little intolerant, the areas in us where we may look down on certain classes of people. And I know, for example, I'm going to share this with you. Somebody that I knew was getting on a, a bus and they were so ashamed. And they said uh, that they had talked to the Lord about it. They were really hurting because they said, look at me. I'm one of them now. So in other words, they saw handicapped people as a whole nother class of people. They looked down on them. They didn't realize that that's what they were really saying. They saw themselves in a much lower light because now they were in the same class with those other people. But those other people were nobody but you and me, but for the grace of God. But in their mind, they saw them through a prejudice mindset as a lower class because they had physical impairments. Isn't that sad that we do that with people? Some of us look at fat people and we look at them and say, mm. well, I say they look at us. <laughs> I'm in that category too. And they, they look down on them. They look at a person with a fat, bumpy face and they think less of them. They don't even want to converse with them because they don't look good in public. So you don't want to associate yourself. That might be God's golden nugget that you could glean some goodies from. But you've cheated yourself from a blessing because you have given a preconceived notion and lowered them in your mind. There are other people you look at. Some of you think when a person speaks with an accent, they're from another country. They can speak their language and your language, and you can barely get yours together. But you're looking down at them because they speak your language with an accent. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad how we think? See, God doesn't like any of that. He doesn't like judgment. He doesn't like partiality. Here, okay, let's get with the body of Christ. Let's get down and dirty. Then I'm going to try to close quickly. Some of us in the body of Christ, pastors on down, bishops or whatever you want to call them, apostles, all, I'm telling you, there is so much partiality in the body of Christ. You will see some people that are jam-packed with gifts, loaded with talent, and nobody will ever suggest that they get to do this, that, or the other. Why? Because they're either fat or they're old, or they speak with a stutter, they have a speech impairment, or they walk with a lamp, or they're in a wheelchair, and they could be so jam-packed with the anointing of God, they could really bring the presence of God right in our midst. But no, they don't fit the image I have in my mind. I'm talking to church, the mindset. So we leave that alone because we don't want that to embarrass us. We don't want them to make a fool out of us. Huh? You know, where does that come from? Another thing, you've got the A group and the B group. Some of you even have a C group. And it's like the kids used to say, this is an A and B conversation. See your way out of it. That's the way you treat a lot of people. See your way out of it. We don't want you here. You know, we tolerate you because you pay your tithes. We tolerate you because, you know, we can count on you to do things nobody else wants to do. Well, we don't really want to be bothered with you. You're too weird. You're too special. 
That's what the church does. That's the message the church puts out. And you cause other people to look down at those people the same way. Because you start laughing at them and making snide remarks about them behind their back. Sometimes in their face. Because some of you don't even have the, 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 the consideration to at least treat somebody with respect. It's really sad. And then you wonder why people don't want to be bothered with your God. Because they figure if they got to go through you to get to God, forget it. They're going to be abused like that. And there's so much abuse going on in the body of Christ. It's a shame before God. It makes God look bad in many people's eyes. Because they judge God by, the, by your lack of character. They judge God by your foul mouth. They judge God by your readiness to gossip and put people down, laugh and joke and jeer at them. They don't want to be around that. They're looking for love, not that crap you're spewing out. So my point is, when you do damage to people, when you take your tongue and use it as a double-edged sword and slice people to smithereens because they don't measure up to your expectations like you bees the judge, whatever, guess what? God is looking at you and he takes that crap personally because what you do to the least of these, you have done it unto him, good or bad. Remember that. What you say behind somebody's back, You've done to him. You set it behind God's back. Be careful how you treat people, whether you know them or not. Be careful about that. Don't make a joke out of anybody. I don't care if they make themselves look like a fool 24-7. Be careful not to be so quick to talk nasty about somebody and be, derade them and, and disrespect them and make a, a, a mockery out of them. Be careful about that, y'all. You don't know people like you think you do. I remember this one woman used to always fuss. Now, I go to the convalescent home and I do prison ministry and I do this and I do that. And boy, these church, they're so at ease. All these folks sitting up here in church, they ain't doing nothing for the Lord. They don't know. Brother Appleseed just got through feeding five or six hungry people out on the street. They don't know that people are, are put, buying clothes. They don't know what people are doing. But they're talking about everybody with a blanket statement like they know what people are doing and what they're not doing. No, they don't. Be careful. This is the body of Christ, y'all. We're not to walk around like spastics. One is over here doing this. Somebody's over there doing that. We're not on one accord. We're splintered. We're fractured. We're broken. We're jacked up, toe up from the floor. And we think we're all that in a bag of chips. And we're going to bust heaven's gates wide open. You better hope you get to see the gates. By the time you get to wreaking your havoc down here. You hear me? Okay, so I'm going to cut it. I'm going to cut it short. God bless you. I hope that you got something out of that. Whatever you do, base it on love, y'all, and not your kind of love, God's kind of love. Because if you base it on your kind of love, there'll be some folks that will never fit into your inner sanctum, to your little inner circle. They'll never arrive. They'll never qualify for you. But what does God say? Who made you the judge? He all he told a friend of mine years ago, who made you the standard? Uh-huh. Think on that one, say la. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with it, and I hope and pray that you can take that to the Lord in prayer and ask him to cleanse you, purify your heart. Purify my heart. And I'm not going to sing because my throat ain't purified. I am. Horses can be. God bless you guys. Be encouraged. Stay in his face. Let him give you a bath every day. You hear me? Let him do the x-ray scope on your soul, on your mind, on your attitude, on your words. 
hunger and thirst after righteousness, he will fill you. Amen? All right, I'm going to end. God bless you.